and welcome to the Eating Disorder Therapist podcast. This is a podcast to help you find peace with food and overcome disordered eating. And I'm Harriet Frew, aka the Eating Disorder Therapist. And I'm so excited to share with you all kinds of stories, tips, information and guest interviews to help you on your journey in finding peace with food. So thank you so much for listening today. Now today I'm talking to Brooke Carlson, an eating disorder therapist working primarily with adolescents and young adults. And she's a licensed professional clinical counselor. And Brooke is based in Minnesota, USA. She's worked for a nationwide eating disorder treatment center for three years called the EMILY program. Brooke was an outpatient therapist and partial hospitalization program coordinator during that time, whilst also running a recovery support group Prior to this, Brooke worked at a university counselling centre where she found her passion for working with students with eating disorders. Brooke now works in private practice as an eating disorder expert and sees clients all day with the hope of creating an intensive outpatient programme in the future. She is also an eating disorder ambassador for the state where she helps with social media and petitioning for Congress and legislation for more resources and care for eating disorders in the state. Brooke has never personally suffered with an eating disorder. However, she has struggled with her own disordered eating and body image distress. She brings this experience with compassion and understanding to her therapy work. In this episode today, Brooke is going to be focusing on exercise and eating disorders, looking at athletics, sports, eating disorders, and a disordered relationship with exercise. And if you're an athlete or have a passion for sports or exercise, this can be a real risk factor for a tricky relationship with food and poor body image. And it's hard sometimes to notice when this has become disordered with the pressures to train, to improve times and ability to compete and perform. So I'm really looking forward to speaking with Brooke today to hear all about her expertise on this subject. Let's get to the conversation. Hi, Brooke. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Hi, Harriet. So nice to meet you. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, thank you. So, Brooke, can I firstly get you to introduce yourself to the listeners, please? Sure, absolutely. I'm Brooke. I'm an LPCC, which is a licensed professional clinical counselor. I work in Minnesota, and I'm from New York, so I'm born and raised New Yorker, but live in Minnesota now for many years, and I'm an eating disorder therapist. So I've worked in a number of different like practices and clinics for eating disorders. I've worked at universities before. I've worked at a national program for eating disorders in a partial hospitalization care, as well as an outpatient facility, where now I currently work in a private practice treating eating disorders, body image, anxiety, depression, you name it, you can definitely find a connection between your relationship with food and relationship with body. And yeah, that's a little bit about me so far. Oh, thank you, Brooke. I understand, Brooke, it's snowing where you are today. (laughs) Is that right? (laughs) <laughs> it is. We're getting so much snow today. Everyone's working from home. People are off the road. So definitely a great time to record a podcast. <laughs> sure. So do you still get like excitement when it snows if you're so like used to it in Minnesota? Like because in the UK, you know, if it snows, it's like major occasion. Everyone has to build a snowman, etc. But like, <laughs> are you very blase about it? Like where you live? You know what? I do really like it. I think it's super pretty. I definitely more so like it when it's around holiday time, when it's like Christmas and New Year's, it definitely gets you in the mood for holiday season. But when it snows in like October before Halloween, that's when it does get kind of depressing. I'm like, no, it's too cold. We're not ready yet. But today is actually a really pretty day with it. (laughs) So Brooke, today we're going to be talking about all things like exercise, sport, athletes, eating disorders and disordered eating. So I know like generally in our culture, exercise or movement is something that's actively encouraged. And, you know, for a lot of people, rightly so, you know, within healthy limits. Mm -hmm. And most of us can benefit hugely with our physical and mental health through some form of active movement. But obviously, when things go too far and exercise becomes obsessive or compulsive, you know, where food has to be earned or, you know, steps counted obsessively or whatever, it can be really problematic. And particularly perhaps if you are an athlete or in sport, you can be more vulnerable. And I guess also I'm thinking with the advent of sort of wellness culture for the last few years, there's a lot of pressure, isn't there? Like with kind of fitness and people who are just ordinary kind of normal people are sometimes fit sort of exercising to 
kind of athlete sort of standards with very strict regimes and all of that. So, yeah, so I just wanted to like dive in, I guess, focusing perhaps initially a bit more on athletes and people in sport. So is there a higher risk if you are in an athlete or in sport that you could develop an eating disorder? Yeah, I definitely think so. And I think just to make sure that like all communities are represented, that anyone can have an eating disorder, right? It doesn't matter that if you're an athlete or if you're more artsy, if you are more musically based, that really eating disorders can impact anyone. From my experience, though, I definitely do see a higher risk within like the sports department and like the athletic community, whether like you're in middle school, if you're in high school, if you're a college athlete, I do think that there can be like a higher pressure when it comes to exercise. Like for example, of like, if you are really into your sport and you feel like you have to do better, you have to like be super successful. And if you want to improve, that's when the relationship with exercise can definitely turn from like a fun activity to more so like compensation or feeling like we need to lose weight to be better at our sport, that there can be like a comparison factor too. that if you want to be a better teammate, or if it's like a very competitive type of sport that you're in, that there's a comparison component as well. And different sports as well, I feel like have different experiences with eating disorders. Like I do notice how dance or gymnastics, swimming, even track, those tend to be some sports I see more often that have uh, students with eating disorders. So I definitely do think there's a higher risk just because of like what you were saying earlier too, that it's great to move. It's great to have exercise. It helps with endorphins and it helps with stress release. And it can also be something that can definitely go down a slippery slope of like compensation and needing to like earn your food, things like that. Mm, Yeah. No, thanks for clarifying that. So it sounds like as well, perhaps, you know, if you are involved in sport, obviously there's that element of competition, which can be very healthy, but can be unhealthy. There's also that pressure sometimes to like, I don't know, get faster times or win matches or achieve. And also that comparison sort of factor as well. So I guess, you know, sort of underneath eating disorders, you know, there's often a feeling of not being good enough, isn't there in some way? And I guess in many ways, like doing sport can be a healthy way to gain sort of self-esteem, a sense of purpose and feeling good about yourself. But yeah, yeah, like what you're saying as well, sometimes, you know, it can tip into an unhealthy place. Those pressures become really intense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because like, it's great to be in a sport. It's great to, you know, have like a social component and make some friends and be part of a community and do something that's really fun for you. And that's wonderful that we all need components like that. And kind of like what we were saying too, it does kind of turn into, in some cases, like really competitive, not only like can our authentic selves be competitive, but so do age disorders can be competitive too, especially when you compare and you want to be better, you want to succeed that you, you know, maybe in some ways too, that sports or athletics are part of your identity too. Like that's a value of yours and how eating disorders can be embedded in that as well. Mm, yeah and it makes a lot of sense and you said that perhaps dance gymnastics or track events you know maybe they could be some of the sports where you could be more vulnerable and what are some of the reasons for this do you think sure I've done a lot of like reflecting over time because I first started working with eating disorders at a university with college athletes actually that's kind of like what fueled my first interest with eating disorders and kind of what I've noticed for the last couple of years is that when it comes to like gymnastics or dance swimming is that there tends to be more of like a body image component within those sports. Uh, You're wearing swimsuits or leotards, tights, things that are more form fitting. And that's when I think we can become more self-conscious of what we look like and how we're moving. And especially with sports where there's like mirrors and things like that, or it's being recorded or videotaped that there can be a lot of times of analyzing yourselves and comparison too. So I think a body image component is definitely part of it, as well as how sometimes like intense those sports can be. I'm not sure if you were ever an athlete area, but those sports I think are really like driven, motivated, a lot of like discipline, things like that, that require a lot of practice and time to like be in these activities and to perform. So I think those are a couple of reasons why. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it sounds incredibly 
tricky I think to be able to sometimes pursue those sports and not to develop some issues with body image I mean I'm sure it's possible but you know it's not a path I pursued myself earlier on in life but I think if I had been in front of the mirror a lot or being videoed a lot or it would be quite hard wouldn't it I think not to become much more focused on your body and I can see how it could perhaps bring out the inner critic And particularly if other people are commenting or teachers, there can be a lot of pressure there, can not there? Yeah, definitely. And too, that, like we said at the very beginning, that exercise is great and wonderful. And that there's a lot of praise that sometimes goes into movement and sports of like, oh my gosh, like you look so great. Like you look wonderful. Like good for you for doing all these things. And that can definitely fuel an eating disorder. Like, okay, I got to keep doing what I'm doing. So that itself fuels maybe the expectation if I have to keep going authentically, but it can influence the eating disorder too. If I need to like keep pushing myself, I need to be better. I need to be smaller. I need to work out more. I need to do all these things. It can just be such a slippery slope and it can be detrimental for some athletes where they get hurt even. Yeah. And I guess it must be quite challenging sometimes to actually diagnose someone that's with an eating disorder or even to recognize if they, you know, are on that slippery slope. Because I guess there's a very fine line between where someone is seemingly functioning and when they go into a very unhealthy place. And maybe those lines are sometimes quite blurred. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Totally agree. Because it's also so normalized, too, of, uh, you know, normal to like go to the gym or do all these classes to go for walks and to lift weights. And in some ways it totally is. So from like an exterior view, it's like, oh, they're so normal. They're taking care of themselves. Like good for them. That's amazing. And then if you tend to look more inward of like, what's actually really going on, like underneath that, is that really the genuineness that's there? Or do we feel like there's maybe negative thoughts or shame or guilt or anxiety about exercise or about our body image or the way that we're eating that's influencing all of this. So it's not always like, you know, a gold standard. Oh my gosh, things are so great that for a lot of people, they feel way worse that they feel like they have to do these things. If not that like, it's a way to spiral out of control. Mm. So when people have approached you for help, have they often self-referred or have you had coaches maybe working in sport who have contacted you showing concerns or what's the kind of typical route? Sure. I think it kind of depends how old. So like for my own practice, I work primarily with like adolescents and young adults and adults as well. So I think it kind of depends on the age piece. For my practice, I do get a lot of referrals from the eating disorder program I used to work with just because they were such a wonderful resource that we still work together. So I'll get referrals from them. I do get referrals from doctors as well, because there will be doctors that are like, hey, I've noticed in the last year that like you've lost quite a bit of weight, or I've noticed that you just don't seem quite like yourself, what's been going on, and then they'll diagnose with an eating disorder. I will say that parents are definitely becoming much more aware of eating disorders as well, where a lot of parents are reaching out of, hey, I'm noticing these things with my kid, I'm wondering if they're struggling with an eating disorder, I think it's just good to talk about it and just have some space for my child which is wonderful. So, so wonderful to do that. So definitely it's kind of like different referral avenues is what I see over here. Mm, Yeah, no, sure. And it's really great to hear that perhaps more parents are recognizing and catching people earlier on, I guess, because I think that wasn't the case so much, was it, sort of in the olden days? (laughs) Oh, (laughs) absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. And I hope we continue to keep growing with understanding eating disorders and all the psychoeducation support and tools for all of that. We're definitely, we're getting there. I think teachers and coaches are also getting better too, because I think even back in the day, coaches also would sometimes give like nutrition guidance when they're not a nutritionist or a dietitian that they would give like workout routines or like, you know, encourage maybe some of these disordered eating or exercise behaviors where now we kind of realize like that's actually not super helpful. So I just hope that we can continue on this track of everyone learning and growing so we can help support anyone with an eating disorder or disordered eating. Yeah, no, that's great to hear, isn't it? Because I guess you know, back in the day as well, coaches were often just sort of passing on the approach that they had received themselves. And it wasn't probably very psychological, was it? Or to even be aware of eating disorders. So it's great that, you know, they are able to sort of recognize now some of these warning symptoms and to be able to step in and maybe not inadvertently do unhelpful things. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, totally. And I think that we're trying to do better too with like health classes and 
you know, learning more about eating disorders in the classroom outside of setting and more people are more open about their journey with an eating disorder too, just so it's not so like hidden and secretive that actually more times than that people do struggle with an eating disorder in the athletic department and in sports that it's much more common than you think it is. So it's just good to have representation and support for that. And now a quick advertisement break. Are you a burned out, high achieving woman who's frustrated that emotional eating, weight gain and exhaustion are self-sabotaging your work and life? You're tired, fatigued, brain fogged, your cravings are through the roof and you feel so insecure in your body and that's impacting the way you show up in your business, career and life. Who could you be if you actually addressed your emotional eating struggles, built food freedom and made peace with your body? Free, that's what. Get support to fully overcome emotional eating, address hormone and gut issues and build the body confidence and connection you've always desired. If you're ready to address each piece, be sure to check out Amber Romaniak, emotional eating, digestive and hormone expert with nine years of experience helping over 1,500 women with support on all of the above without diets, without restriction or quick fixes. She will do a full health assessment and help you get to the root of your symptoms with hormone testing, gut health and of course support to help your body come back to balance with your mind and soul. Visit amberapproved.ca to book a 30-minute body freedom call or check out the No Sugar Coating podcast today to learn more about the connections between our relationship with food, mindset and our health and how it impacts the way we show up in all areas of our lives. So how would an athlete or even a non-athlete know perhaps they had a problem with over-exercise and that they maybe their relationship with exercise was concerning? What are some of the warning signs to look out for? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I think there's lots of different things to look out for. I think it's important to look at the behaviors, the thoughts, like the cognitions, and then the feelings behind it. I think if you kind of use like that pillar mentality or that pillar kind of diagram, that's helpful to assess someone's either eating disorder with exercise or disordered eating with exercise. One of the things I would think being like, how often is someone exercising? And what is the intent of someone's exercising? You know, if they're going out for a walk because it's been a long day and they just kind of need like a breather, that's one thing. Versus if someone is going out to exercise because they feel really guilty for eating out with their friends that night and that they feel they need to like burn it off or if they feel guilty about something or if they are preparing for a meet, for example, if we're going to keep with the sports context, that they should overexercise to look better or do better within their sport. Those are all things to look at. Really just the intention of like, what's the purpose of exercising? And if there's any type of like compensation effect would be another important warning sign to look at. And if someone's also super exhausted, like if they're so tired and that they have to prioritize their schedules, even though when they're so busy or they're prioritizing exercise, even though they don't really feel like they want to or should, that they will anyway, no matter if they're busy or tired, don't want to, that they'll still push themselves and do it anyway. Mm, yeah, so there's lots of things there, isn't there? But it sounds like, yeah, the looking at the intention behind it is so important, isn't it? Like you're sort of saying in a way, if someone's had a long day and they're feeling like, I'd love to go for a walk and just like be outside and feel good. And it's feeling like a sort of energetic step forward. That's one thing, isn't it? But if it's like becomes this should that you have to do it to burn off what you've eaten or just to because you can't sit still almost because you feel like you have to be moving. Otherwise, you're going to feel guilty. You know, so it's important, isn't it, to kind of go within maybe and question yourself. What is your intention? How are you feeling as well about this exercise? Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. To look at all of that. And also, if you see like a lot of contemplation of like, oh, should I work out? Should I not? I really don't want to, but also I think I need to, but I'm so tired. But if I don't do these things and like I'm lazy. So if you also notice like a lot of back and forth within cognitions, and then if there's a lot of guilt of I can't work out, I just literally don't have time that you almost ruminate on that of like, oh, I'm such a lazy person. I'm so unhealthy. I didn't go do that. That's another piece I would say to definitely look at that as well. Yeah, I know that's so helpful, that contemplation. And I think it's a tricky thing, isn't it, with exercise? Because I think for a lot of people that have an obsessive relationship with exercise, there are probably pockets of their week where they are in a more authentic, healthy, enjoyable, flourishing place with exercise. 
where you know they would perhaps you know if they were in that more healthy space they would be doing some of that exercise anyway but it's almost like the quantity and the intention I guess of all those extra bits isn't it and then I guess sometimes then all the joy is lost, isn't it? But it's hard to, I'm sort of thinking sometimes with people I work with, I think they find it hard to differentiate sometimes between what is their kind of joyful movement and what is their sort of exhaustive should exercise. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Exercise is one of those pieces too, that if you're working with someone who's been through like residential or inpatient treatment, that a lot of times that the only movement that they're getting is some type of yoga. So that for a few weeks or a few months that people aren't going to the gym, they're not going for walks or running or things like that, just because that was probably not part of their treatment plan. So that when they're in recovery and they're making really great progress and they're maintaining all these wonderful things that they come into this point of like, I'm kind of interested in exercise, but that feels wrong in some way because it's part of like their initial treatment plans. And it is kind of rebuilding that relationship with movement of like debunking what the values were for your eating disorder and exercise before. And what's this new value that you want to have? Like, what does this new relationship look like? And oftentimes it is exploring that joyful movement. And it is sometimes challenging those societal beliefs of what exercise should look like. So it takes such a process to find your joy and find your authenticity with exercise or movement just because of your treatment experience but also for what society says for movement it definitely is a process I say for people so if you're working with someone who's struggling with this issue would that be one of the first pieces of work you may be doing with them I mean I guess it's quite complex isn't it (laughs) but I'm just thinking like (laughs) particularly around the exercise piece would it be looking at some of their values maybe and like getting like you know starting a fresh experience with exercise I guess like maybe rooted in different values and then also exploring some of those societal beliefs and challenging them so they're kind of getting into their own lane almost Mm -hmm. definitely I think those are great avenues to go down and even just like posing the question of like if you were to decrease exercising like what thoughts or things would come up for you and even though you're not saying stop exercise and see what happens even just exploring like what if this were to be something we were to decrease? Like, what would that be like for you? You can kind of gauge people and see where they're at and, you know, either their feelings or like how rigid they are with things and some of their cognitions can be really powerful from even just that question. And then looking at like, how else can we fill our time? And do you actually really enjoy movement and exercise? Like, is that something authentically fun for you? Because there's some people that do, that they like exercise, they like to move their body, they like to try new activities and do it with other people. And that's great. And there's some people who hate exercise that absolutely, it's the last thing that they'd ever want to do, but they feel pressured that they should be doing these things because either, you know, coaches or doctors or society says, it, or social media even says that you should be doing these things. So it is a lot of exploration of like, what's important to you? Like, what do you value? How else do you like to spend your time and what also feels like that cup of joy that you have within you? If that's movement, amazing. If it's not, that's totally okay. And how can we look at challenging some of those distortions around it? Mm, That's so helpful. So it sounds like a lot of kind of curious and compassionate kind of questioning, isn't it? And helping someone really explore like what's underneath, why they're doing what they're doing, what it means to them and you know, maybe like looking at it in a whole different way that they perhaps have never done before. And I love like the way you say a cup of joy as well, because it's, I guess as well, if you've been over exercising, you're going to have this void, aren't you, as you start to reduce your exercise. And it is really important to be filling that cup of joy and thinking about what else is going to bring you fulfillment and yeah, joy. <laughs> right absolutely like it's looking at those coping skills and it's looking at like things that authentically like make you happy you know like what would it be like to spend time with other people or try something new you know go to a new place or get back to something that maybe you haven't been doing for a long time something that you really love that maybe you put on pause due to life and what's it like to re like incorporate that again I think that can be such a beautiful like insight gathering time and also something that's so connecting back to like your authentic self and that might include exercise and that may not and that's okay either way Mm. 
So for anyone listening as well, who may be locked in a really sort of destructive place for their exercise and they're wanting to reduce it, when you work with your clients, would they sort of come up with perhaps, you know, a little goal on how they may like reduce their exercise gradually? Or do you tend to do it more in a cold turkey way and then restart again? Or, you know, or is it, does it depend on the person? That's a great question. I think it can <laughs> depend just because we know eating disorders can be really serious that sometimes it is medically warranted to not exercise, you know, depending on someone's medical stability. So that should definitely be determined by a doctor or physician. When it comes to exercise, it's even looking at like, how would you feel about decreasing? Is that something that you would like to do as a goal? And I think kind of even weaning back a little bit, like taking baby steps is usually a little bit easier instead of seven days a week, let's just try five. And those two days that you're not doing those things, what can we do instead? Because it is going to be different, right? We have all this time and it's more space for more thoughts and feelings. So it is kind of like a cope ahead and using support time during that time and see like, how was that for you? Did you enjoy it? Like what came up for you? And that's when you kind of can guide their relationship of how much or how little or how else do you want to spend your time doing that? And even trying other things. If you want to go exercise or have movement, absolutely. Let's maybe walk instead. Let's, you know, do some yoga or do some stretching and see how that goes. Mm, They're really helpful. So I guess it's very much on the individual, isn't it? And it's really important for the client to kind of come up with their own kind of goals and what feels manageable and even to decide whether they feel ready to make a change in the first place because I guess it's got to become from that place of stepping forward with motivation hasn't it rather than doing it to please you or me or anyone else Mm -hmm. Um, absolutely it's way more beneficial when a client says you know what I think I really want to reevaluate my relationship with movement I want to you know have more space in my life for other things I'm ready to make that change and then you can kind of see where they're at and meet them where they're at and adjust their goals in that way versus someone who's not ready whatsoever because it's scary it's scary making changes right you know it's unknown it's unpredictable so it's just meeting them where they're at with lots of compassion and psychoeducation about this mm-hmm. I know I've worked with some clients as well who have really struggled to reduce their exercise because, as we're saying, it is incredibly scary, but then sometimes have been faced with an injury or an illness or something like life has kind of intervened, Mm -hmm. you know, helpfully or unhelpfully, I guess, as he would wish to interpret it. (laughs) But someone has always been forced into a place of not being able to exercise. And obviously that sometimes has been absolutely terrifying and scary Mm -hmm. to begin with. But it has sometimes almost been a way to reset. Not that anyone would wish that on themselves, but, you know, I'm just wondering as well if you've experienced that with some of your clients. Oh, yeah, definitely. That through eating disorders that people have had like stress fractures where like they can't be in their sport or their heart rate is dangerously low or they can't do sports. And that's where it is such a compassion validation point of it does suck when you can't do those things, especially to like if they're, a college athlete and they're on scholarship or if they are in middle school and going to state championships for something or they're just really into their sport because that's where their best friends are or they have to take a break to even go to treatment for their eating disorder that it is a bit of grief of I know it is really hard like it so does suck it's so not easy especially when this is an important part of your life and in some way it is like a bit of a relief of this is a time where you can just take care of yourself and do what you need to do. And that movement will always be there. We only get one body. So if we take care of it and that we give it the time, space and healing that it needs, it's something that you can definitely explore in the future too. So it's not a never ever again type of thing that it's definitely something that's temporary. So I think that's something that's helpful to of it's temporary. If this is what matters to you, it's important to you. We can absolutely work to rebuild this. And maybe it's a time to really take the space when we're not doing the sport or the activity to really look at who are you? Like, who is this person aside from like our athlete, our sport self? Because I think sometimes our identity can be so connected to our authentic self, but also our sport with identity for eating disorders can be interconnected too. So it is space to really evaluate and analyze like, you know, how is this all playing a role with one another and how can we reconfigure it so that we can live a happy, healthy life in recovery? 
Mm, yeah, such great helpful points in there. I think the bit around identity, like, yeah, it makes so much sense, doesn't it? If your kind of identity is just really understandably tied up with perhaps being with sport, doing sport, being with your friends, being part of a team, like it takes up all the nights of your week. And then suddenly that's taken away from you. That's hugely destabilizing, mm-hmm. isn't it? And very, very challenging. A real grief, definitely. Definitely. Especially when like they're middle schoolers or like adolescents too. They're like, that's their world. You know, this is like what they do every day. It's what they look forward to. That's their social meters being met or that's their time away from home when it's nice to have a break from parents that it's their zone, you know, and that's so much of like who they are and they're trying to figure themselves out. And for a lot of people that age are like, yeah, that's my thing that I do. Like, this is like who I am. And when you have to have a pause on it, it does kind of feel empty in a way, having to re-navigate of who am I without this and that grief element again. Mm-hmm. Now, I love the way, though, that you talk about sort of the reframe of seeing it as a temporary phase, though, and that actually you have one body, but, it you know, you can work back to being able to move again and, you know, to give a lot of hope. And it's not like you have to give up exercise or activity forever, is it? It's a pause, really, while you reevaluate. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's kind of like, you know, if you like if you need a if you have a cavity, for example, you have to fill the cavity. So you have to like do what you have to do to help it. And sometimes when it comes to relationship with exercise, sometimes you just need to have like that symptom interruption and that pause just so we can like take care of it. Mm-hmm. So, Brick, you've given us a lot of helpful tips already on how to navigate a different relationship with exercise. Are there any other key components that you might include in your working with someone, perhaps around body image focus or anything else? I would definitely say to work with a therapist who has experience working with eating disorders, disordered eating body image issues, just so that way, you know, at least whoever you're talking to is someone that has experience with this. This can definitely feel like an isolating experience. Sometimes you kind of feel like no one understands me or that what I'm feeling is like all where just having like that person who really understands it, that also has clinical experience, I think would be the first step when it comes to exercise and like body image. There's a lot of really great like bibliotherapy options that are out there. I've read some really phenomenal books for body image, and I don't know if there's a way to connect Harriet. I would love to send you some recommendations. I think it's really taking space to look inward of like who you are genuinely and who you are authentically, to look at those joys, to look at those values, to look at you know things that build you up, to maybe set boundaries around exercise, or maybe it's setting boundaries around certain people who have maybe triggering perspectives or thoughts about exercise or food, because that can be tough too. You know, if you have someone saying like, Oh, I didn't go to the gym today. Like that's so like not healthy of me. Well, that's going to make someone feel bad. Right. So it is kind of looking at those boundaries of, you know, who maybe has a similar positive, healthier view on exercise and how can we surround ourselves like that? How can we advocate for ourselves using some of our communication skills assertiveness skills of like, you know what, that's not really helpful when you say things like that. And really like working on those empowerment skills, I think is another really great step. And focusing on rest too, like not only just like physical rest, but also emotional and mental rest as well. I think that's a really key important part too, within recovery or within any type of therapeutic work is that ability to give yourself rest but also grace and compassion through this point too, because we do live in a wonderfully messy world. So I think it's important just to really highlight those elements too of compassion and grace, but also rest. Life is busy. We do a lot every day. It's okay to take time for yourself and not do all the things you think you're supposed to do. Yeah, no, I love that actually. Rest, grace, and compassion. (laughs) The Holy Trinity. (laughs) Yeah. Um. (laughs) So, and Brooke, I would love to hear your book recommendations, actually, and I can put them in the show notes. But would you be happy to tell us on air any books that you particularly come to mind that the listeners may be interested in? Sure. There's two I really love. They're my absolute favorites. One of them is called Perfectly Imperfect. You have to forgive me. I don't have the author's names remembered, but Perfectly Imperfect is a really great book. It is written by a counselor and it's a super nice, like, 
condensed book. It's super short. There's a lot of great like helpful tips and tricks and skills that are in that book that I think are so helpful for like body image, I would say. They do highlight some elements of what I was saying with like the compassion rest piece in that book as well. That's a great one. I think that's really wonderful for anyone. There is another book too called Beyond Beautiful. I remember the author's first name is like, oh, it's Anushka Reese. That just popped in my head. (laughs) That's a really great book too. I think that one is really great for like young adults. It's a little bit more relatable. It's a little bit more like there's some jokes that are in the book. It's just a really like, it's funny in there too, but it's just so connectable too. Like you can just, no matter who you are, you can kind of relate to that book. And that can be about exercise, body image, just living as a woman in society. Those are two really great books that come to mind. Okay, no, wonderful. And yeah, perfectly imperfect. I know Amy, well, I don't know Amy Harmon, but she's been on the podcast before, like ages ago, probably two years ago. That's so, right. Oh, I yeah. didn't remember that. <laughs> so yeah, but brilliant. I'm really pleased for it that you recommended that because of that, that's a book I love as well. And it's just like really easy to read, isn't it? It's like, mm-hmm. and like, yeah, like easy to dive in and out of and get some like really great nuggets from. So I'll definitely put that in the show notes. And Beyond Beautiful, it's not one I've read, but I would be very keen to read that as well. It's a great one. Yeah, it's got like a pink and orange cover with a beautiful like illustration on it. You can get those from Amazon. Those are really great ones. There's some also like body image workbooks that are out there that are great. There's another one called, you'll have to forgive me, like Eating in the Light of the Moon is another good one. That's a little bit more like poetic, I would say has like some short stories about like body image and movement. That's another good one. Mm, okay, brilliant. Yeah, great. It's really nice to hear some recommendations. So thank you for that. Yeah, of course. So Brooke, where can people find you if they want to like message you, get in touch, find out more about the work that you do? For sure. So I work for a private practice called All In Therapy Clinic. There are two locations. We have a location in Edina. Minnesota and then Minnetonka, Minnesota. And I work at the Edina location. So you can definitely look us up online and you can either call us or email us and you'll see my bio on the website. So you can look at my bio and see if we would be a good fit. We do meet and greets at all in to kind of see if you feel like this person would be a good match. You get a free 30 minute check-in hangout session with me. So you can always do that. And then, yeah, I have currently a wait list right now for clients, but I definitely try to work through and see as many people as possible since I really love what I do here. So you can always just call us and we can get a meet and greet set up or get a future appointment set up. Great. And Brooke, do you see people from all over the world or just in the US or just in Minnesota even? (laughs) I'm just (laughs) licensed in Minnesota right now. So I can see people with insurance or fee-for-service in Minnesota, and then I can see people who are out of state that would just not be covered by insurance. It'd be great if I could see people all over the world. Maybe that's like a good goal for the future. (laughs) But right now, unfortunately, no. Sure, no. Well, I'm glad I clarified that because you might have got like (laughs) inundated with inquiries from people in like Australia or something. (laughs) I mean, that'd be super cool. Maybe one day. (laughs) Yeah, no future goal, hey. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay, well, Brooke, I'd really like to thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. It's just been really interesting to talk about over-exercise and looking at eating disorders in sport and with athletes. And I think so many like golden tips that people are going to be able to take away. And also you've got a lot of hope and understanding about this issue, I think, which people can really take forward. So thank you so much. Oh my gosh, you're so welcome. Thank you for having me. I so appreciate you and anyone listening. Yeah, thank you. And I hope you have a wonderful day. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation just as much as I did. And do go and check out all of Brooke's details in the show notes. If you're not following me already, do seek me out on Instagram at the eating disorder therapist underscore. And for further support with your relationship with food, do go to the eating disorder therapist.co.uk. If you enjoy this podcast i would be so grateful if you would follow rate and review as it helps it reach so many more listeners thank you so much for listening today and i look forward to sharing another podcast episode with you very soon mm-hmm.